So on this journey with Lord God Jesus, we are at a place on the map called Clothing Spirit Part 6. And here, we're going to see how the Word of God points out His Spirit clothing His people. So we're going to start in the book of John, chapter 21, verse 7. And then we're going to hop on down to verses 15 through 19. Chapter 21, verse 7. Then the disciple, and this is referring to John, whom Jesus loved. And this word loved is to prefer, to love, what God prefers. And in the Greek, it is called agapao. And it is God's type of love. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said he laid it to rest to Peter. It is the Lord. And remember this word Lord is a person exercising absolute ownership rights, Lord or Master. As soon as Simon Peter heard, it is the Lord, he wrapped, or to gird around, his outer garment, which is an outer tunic. In its word origin, comes from unfitting and clothed, or to be clothed in the sense of sinking into a garment, around him, for he was naked or poorly clothed, and cast himself into the sea. So we're going to hop on down now to verses 15 through 19. Verse 15. When they had finished eating, the noon meal, that is, Jesus said he laid it to rest to Simon Peter. Simon, son of John, do you love? And this word love is the to prefer to love, what God prefers. Do you love me more? And this is a greater in quantity, comparatively, more than, greater in number than these. Yes, Lord. And remember, that's the master, Lord. He said, he laid it to rest. You know, which is to see physically, bridging over to mentally seeing, which then is a gateway to grasp spiritual truth. So in other words, physical, mental, and to spiritual. You know that I love you. However, Peter uses a different love. He uses a love to show warm affection and intimate friendship. Jesus said he laid it to rest. Feed my lambs. In other words, the Lord was saying, Nourish the young that still drink milk. Or what milk? The word of God milk. That which is easy to digest. So he is to feed his people, those that are young, not necessarily in age, but young in the faith. He is to feed them the word of God. 16. Again, Jesus said he laid it to rest. A second time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And this is the preferred love. He answered he laid it to rest. This is Peter. Yes, Lord. Remember, Master. You know, from the physical to the mental to the spiritual, that I love you. And again, this love was a warm affection and intimate friendship. Jesus said he laid it to rest. Shepherd my sheep. Or in other words, guard and guide his people of all ages. 17. The third time he, Jesus said, laid it to rest to him. Simon, son of John, do you love? And this time Jesus uses a different word for love. He uses the same that which Peter used to show warm affection and an intimate friendship. Do you love me? Peter. Now, remember that Peter means a stone, such as a small rock found along a pathway, an isolated rock. And remember Jesus is our cornerstone. And all rocks are built upon Jesus. He's the beginning. And so you and I, too, are like little stones or rocks. And he's building his church. He's building his temple. Peter was hurt. And this word hurt is to experience deep emotional pain, severe sorrow, grief. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? And that word love, remember, was to show warm affection and an intimate friendship. But listen to that again. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love in a warm affection me? Not, do you prefer to love me? He said, this is Peter, Lord, 
you know, remember from the physical to the mental to the spiritual, all things are all parts. You know, and this word is to know, especially through a personal experience, you know that I love the warm affection, you. Jesus said he laid it to rest. Feed my sheep, which is to nourish the mature or maturing with grass or meat. Grass or meat, yes, the word of God, that which is deeper into the word, that takes more to digest, those who are a little further in their faith. So I want you to see something here, that in this conversation, Jesus is giving Peter commands, commanding to feed all of his flock and shepherd them. Verse 18, truly, truly. And remember, this is what is sure, certain, amen. Most assuredly, so let it be. And this is twice, it's not going anywhere. Truly, truly, I tell you, I lay it to rest to you. And this is Jesus speaking to Peter. When you were younger, you dressed or you girded yourself and walked or walked around in a complete circuit, going full circle where you desired or wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. And remember that hand, it's an instrument a person uses to accomplish their purpose. You will stretch out your hands and another will dress or gird you and lead or to bear, carry along you where you do not desire or want. So I want you to stop and think about Jesus after his baptism of the Holy Spirit, how he was led into the wilderness. And remember Jesus the night before his crucifixion, how he spoke with his father to take away a very close cup and that which he would have to drink, that it would be the plan of the Father to take away that cup and for this plan to become from the Father and not the desire of Jesus. But Jesus was obedient with the will, the desire of the Father, and he was led to the cross where he finished the work on the cross unto death, and he also drank the sour vinegar, the sour wine. So you need to see that to love Jesus is to prefer to love his word over your desires. It is to love his word, his desire, his will, his purpose for you over your will, your desire, your purpose. As did Jesus, he preferred to love his father's cup and that which he drank. Jesus completed the work set before him. You too have a covenant cup to drink, but everyone's cup is unique from the Lord. So ask yourself, do you know his will, his desire, his purpose for you? How are you to drink his wine if you don't know his desire, will, or purpose for you? If you drink from what you do not know, you drink in vain. So, Listen to this. Fear God, love his commands, and follow him into his everlasting covenant. He has prepared for you since the foundation of the earth. Now walk in his spirit clothed upon you. And I am not talking about John's baptism with water, a baptism of repentance in order for people to believe into Jesus. No, I am talking about a baptism from the risen one, Jesus who baptizes with the Holy Spirit in fire. If you do not know what I'm talking about, ask our God, Jesus, and may he send his spirit upon you, clothing you for his great purpose, lest you be naked. For Christ was naked or poorly clothed on the cross for you and I. Now cover your shame with Jesus. That is his works, his righteousness, his spirit, and follow him. So I want you to see something. I'm going to read verse 15 through 19 again. And I want you to see the difference with the preferred love that Jesus is looking for his people to do, to do unto him. 15. When they had finished eating the noon meal, Jesus laid it to rest to Simon Peter. Simon, son of John, do you love, prefer to love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, he laid it to rest. You know that I affectionately love you. 
Jesus said he laid it to rest. Feed my lambs. 16. Again Jesus said he laid it to rest. A second time. Simon, son of John, do you love, prefer to love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you affectionately. Jesus said, laid it to rest, shepherd my sheep. 17. The third time he said he laid it to rest to him, Simon, son of John, do you affectionately love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you affectionately love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know through a personal experience I affectionately love you. Jesus said he laid it to rest. Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I tell you, I lay it to rest to you. When you were younger, you dressed, you girded yourself and walked where you wanted or desired. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, the purpose of you. And another will dress or gird you and lead you, carry you to where you do not desire. 19. Jesus said this to signify the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Glorify, meaning to ascribe weight by recognizing real substance or value. So how is he glorifying the Lord? So remember that Jesus told his disciples that within the night, this was the night he was arrested before his crucifixion. That within the night, that they all would fall away because of Jesus. And Peter told Jesus that if all fell away, he would never fall away because of Jesus. But Jesus told Peter that during the night, before the cock calls out, three times he would deny Jesus. But Peter laid it to rest to Jesus that even if it were necessary for him, Peter together with Jesus to die, he would not deny Jesus. So when Jesus gave commands to Peter regarding his sheep, that which we've been speaking about here in verses 15 through 17, Jesus distinguishes his love from Peter's love. Remember, Jesus' love is a preferred God's love, whereas Peter was an affectionate love. And an affectionate love is what Jesus points out Peter has towards his people. But to Jesus, it is to be a preferred God love. And Peter will glorify God by loving Jesus as a preferred love, which is unto death, as he stated he would do before he actually denied Jesus. This is what was so hurtful to Peter. He recognized that there was a time he said he would die with Christ, and he could not do that. He denied him, let alone die for him. But here, following Jesus, he learned to have a preferred love for Christ, and he did it. He died for him, for his name's sake, and glorified God. Verse 19, Jesus said this to signify what kind of death by which Peter would glorify God in this having said, he, Jesus, laid it to rest to him. Follow me. So now we're going to go to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 14. And then this time we're going to hop on up in chapter 19 to verses 1 through 9. So verse 14. And the armies within heaven were following him. Well, who's him? That who is faithful and true, who has many crowns on his head. He has a name called the Word of God. The Word became flesh, remember. That's Jesus. And the armies within heaven were following him. Our Word. Riding on white or bright horses and dressed in or to clothe or to be clothed within the sense of sinking into a garment. And remember, this is the Word in which Jesus used when he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem, to wait for him to send the promise of the Father upon them, clothing them in the power, in God's power, riding on white, bright horses and dressed or clothed in, as in a sense of sinking into a garment, a fine linen. And this word is made of fine linen. And its word origin is from a species of flax, riding on white horses and clothed in fine linen, white, bright, and clean. And this word clean, is without admixture, 
what is separated, purged, clean, pure because unmixed. So I want you to remember that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. And you see here, this is a spiritual revelation of what is to come. And those who follow Christ do not follow him in the flesh. They follow him in his spirit. So do not be mixed, not knowing which way to walk in the flesh or the spirit. You either walk in your flesh or you either walk in the spirit. Be one or the other. Do not be lukewarm. And remember this. When you follow Jesus, you never stop. You will follow him from this age into the next age and into eternity. So now we're going to hop on up in chapter 19 to verses 1 through 9. 19 verse 1. After this I, and this is John who wrote this, I heard what sounded like the loud or large or great in the widest sense voice or sound or language of a great, which is in quantity or numerous, crowd or multitude, within heaven, saying, laying it to rest, Hallelujah. And this word hallelujah means praise Yahweh. Remember, praise to become the salvation and the glory, the value and the power that is of God's miraculous power belong to the God, the creator, the owner of all things, who sustains all things, unrestricted in power, dominion, the God of us to For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great, large, great, in the widest sense, prostitute, the idolatrous community, in other words, who corrupted the earth by her adulteries, her sexual immoralities, idolatry, and that which she sold herself off, remember, and sold others off. And when you're selling off, you are now replacing Christ with something else or attempting to place something or anyone beside Christ, that is not possible. He is the head. There is nobody else beside him. We are the body. We are underneath him as one. And he has avenged the blood of his servants out of the hand of her. Three, and a second time, they said, Hallelujah. In other words, praise Yahweh. Praise to become And the smoke from her goes up into the ages of the ages, or forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, the creator, the owner, the sustainer, who was seated on the throne. And they said they laid it to rest. Amen. And remember, amen. Jesus is our amen. He is what is sure and certain. He is verily of a truth, most assuredly. So let it be. Hallelujah. Praise to Yahweh. Praise to become. And the voice or the sound or the language came forth from the throne, saying, laying to rest, praise the God, the creator, the owner, the sustainer of us. Remember, all became through Jesus. He sustains all, all his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. Verse 6. And I heard what sounded like a voice, a sound, a language, a great and quantity, numerous, crowd or multitude, and like the sound or voice or language of many numerous waters, and like a mighty sound or voice or language of thunder, saying, laying to rest, hallelujah, praise Yahweh to become, since has reigned, and this is to reign as king, to exercise dominion, rule, has reigned. Lord, and remember that word Lord, is a person exercising absolute ownership rights, an owner, a master. So since has reigned as king, Lord, the God, the creator, the owner, the sustainer of us, the Almighty. And this word Almighty in the Greek is Almighty, unrestricted power, exercising absolute dominion. And it comes from two origin words, all to prevail, each and every part of all of its totality and to place under its own grasp, put under control. Verse 7, let us rejoice, and that is to delight in God's grace, and exult, boast, or leap, and give him 
glory, value, worth. Because the wedding, this is a wedding celebration of the lamb. What lamb? The lamb that was slain since the foundation of the earth. Christ Jesus, remember? That it was hidden? Has come. And his bride, which is a woman, lady, or wife, has made herself ready or prepared. Eight, fine linen, which remember is fine linen, and it comes from a species of flax, bright and clean. Remember, that's without admixture. What is separated, purged, clean, pure, because unmixed. And remember, we're to walk in the Spirit, unmixed. For was given her in order to wear, to be clothed, and this is to throw around, wrap a garment about, fine linen. Again, remember that's from flax. It's for the righteous acts. And this is an act God approves, a judicially approved act, an act which is right according to the Lord, an act of righteousness. Emphasis is on results that go with having God's approval. Righteousness. Fine linen is for the righteous acts of the holy or saints. And this word holy is different, unlike other. Holy, different from the world, because like the Lord, it is set apart. So I'm going to reread that from 7. Let us rejoice and exalt, bolster, leap, and give him glory, because the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready, prepared, fine linen, bright and clean, unmixed. For it was given her to wear, to be clothed, to thrown around, wrap her garment about her. Fine linen is for the righteous acts of the holy, the saints. That's God's people. Nine, and he, and this is the messenger, the angel, said to me, that's to John, write, blessed are those into the supper. And this word supper is an afternoon or evening meal. And its word origin is cost or expense. There's a cost or an expense to enter this supper. Remember your life. Remember what Jesus said? Those who died to this life will save it. Taking up that cross, denying yourself, and following him. Blessed are those into the supper, the wedding celebration of the lamb. And remember the lamb. He too had a cost. He became the least, the servant of all, dying for the entire world while we were all still sinners. He died for us. It cost him something. And this wedding celebration we see here is a covenant consummation and not the way man sees it. It is a different type of intimacy. It is between the bridegroom, the lamb, Jesus, and the bride. And that is the church that he builds. Remember those stones that he builds, his temple? And to his body, prepared as a bride, he, Jesus, as the head, and we, the body, as one kingdom, right Blessed are those into the supper, the wedding celebration of the Lamb, who are called or invited. So remember this, not all who are called enter in. And he added, he laid it to rest. And this is the messenger to John. These are the true, and that which is true, real. Emphasizing the organic connection between what is true and its source or origin, down to its inner makeup, reality true inside and out, words, the speech or the message of God. Remember, our creator, our owner, our sustainer, and that's our word of God, and that's Jesus. So you can start to see here now the depths of his spirit clothing his people and how important this is into the wedding. So next time, a clothing spirit, part seven, we're going to continue to see how the word of God points out even more of his spirit being clothed upon, his people being ready for him.